So we're here with John Stoltz from IBM. John's working in the kernel working group on Android upstreaming, but John, tell me a bit about yourself, where you live, um, uh, what you worked on before coming to Lenaro. Yeah, so I live in Portland, Oregon, and I work for IBM. Um, there, in the past, I've worked on uh, Linux enablement on kind of large uh, new Max 86 systems, and uh, also on enterprise uh, real-time Linux, where we basically worked on trying to uh, use the uh, preempt RT patch to you know, reduce latencies and allow uh, uh, kind of large enterprise workloads, sort of like you know, high frequency trading and that sort of thing, uh, to have deterministic to have, yeah, direct deterministic behavior. Yeah. Right. So I know in the kind of working group you've been doing um, all this Android upstreaming organization and effort to to get the patches cleaned up and also just looking at what the use cases are upstream and so on. So you know, what are the big pieces in, in, in this Android upstreaming puzzle? Okay. So um, I guess probably the most well known are the wake locks, but it's actually kind of not the most critical in some ways. Right. Um, so Binder, Ashmem, and Logger are the three that are kind of most nece necessary for the user space environment to run. Right. Um, because user space depends on those kernel APIs? Yes, yeah, those are APIs that are required for the user environment basically to so run. So if I'm running an Android app, it will depend on these things. Yeah. Right. Um, and so underneath that, there's things, you know, so then you start looking at things like, um, wake locks, which basically are kind of a power enhancement on top of, you know, with being, make, letting this machine suspend and save more power than it would normally. Right. Um, but the applications, you know, while they may need to be wake lock aware in order to use it, if the wake lock infrastructure is missing, it doesn't cause them, you know, it's nothing that they actually are requesting from the current kernel, they're just more advising the kernel um, right. uh, not to suspend. Um, and what else is there? So there's a lot of stuff that can just be, um, you know, uh, uh, we've got, let's see here. So there's some other features that are useful um, for things like debugging. So they've got you know the RAM console and a panic, which is less useful, I guess, uh, these days on the newer hardware. But right. um, let's see here. What else? Um, pulling a little bit of a blank all of a sudden. Um, so there's a lot of work in Bluetooth and MMC, just kind of driver enablement, adding smaller features that are necessary. Um, some stuff like supporting extra partitions and you know right. that. that which they actually yeah, that on. sort of things. Yeah. Um, not necessarily at a system level, it depends on how it's built, but it's things that they want. Uh, YAS2 is useful for NAND. Uh, uh, for what they're running on. NAND systems, yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's more of a legacy thing these days. Right. Um, but so the thing is that much of the critical pieces, specifically the Ashman binder and logger, yeah. um, have actually gone upstream recently in 3.3, and so it's kind of cool. Right now there's, we're basically just one small patch away from being able to run uh, the Android environment on a vanilla kernel. Right, that's why I was really to one yeah. um, And uh, yeah, so I think that's going to be a nice bit of progress because it lets folks, you know, be able to get up and running on the latest kernel with whatever enablement they're doing and be able to at least have that started. It's, maybe it's not ready for production, sort of, you know, you'll, you'll want the yeah, rest yeah. of the stack, but um, it, it, it lets developers kind of get moving. So let's talk about these three critical pieces there. So like Binder, mm -hmm. Ashman, and Logger, right? Yep. So what do they do individually there? What, um, what are they for? So logger basically just allows uh, you to, you know, it, it, it is basically just a regular system logger, but it's partitioned in a couple of ways just so that uh, a rogue application that just is spewing out all sorts of noise won't cause uh, system messages to get lost and overwhelmed. Right. Um, so it, it's fairly straightforward and um, just kind of useful in that way. Um, binder is a much more complicated IPC mechanism that is Kind of, I don't know. It's one of those things. Um, what does that use it for? Maybe well, basically, just uh, a lot of things, but a lot of it's communication between uh, processes. So it's how they got often pass uh, things like file descriptors between applications that will share resources such as buffers and that sort of thing. Right. So it's, it's kind of a low level thing that everybody ends up using, right? Yeah, it's very critical to their, um, I guess, user environment. Um, it's 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 definitely a larger and less well-known sort of chunk of work. It's uh, something that I've actually not dug as deeply into because um, I guess in a way it, it's it's sort of it's contentious, but it's in that way where people talk about things that, you know, logger everyone's sort of bike shedding about because everybody's understand logger, uh, some sort of logging infrastructure yeah, yeah. and had to interact with it. Um, whereas binder, I feel like, is sort of that submarine, which is the opposite of the problem. Where, like, not Nobody many people really understand it, so nobody really has a whole lot to say. There's, there's some people who, you know, they realize it duplicates infrastructure and, you know, they don't like that aspect, but it's... But how do we share file descriptors and do IPC in real Linux? Um, well, I mean, you could just pass file descriptors over um, sockets, Unix sockets, that sort of thing. Um, Why don't they do that in Android? 
Oh, so I actually have less familiarity with that. Uh, some of it is some legacy aspects. So Binder actually comes from originally from EOS, right. which a lot of the Android developers, I guess, or a number of Android developers kind of have come, come from. Um, and ah, so right. it's sort of some history of how they work with things that they like. Um, it's also useful because it's able to send messages without, uh, um, you know, basically, you don't need uh, uh, something like, uh, another thing that people compare it to is like Dbus, right? So sending messages between applications, but you don't need to have another system daemon who you pass the message, context switch to it, then it, it might die. Switch, and it's what happens, yeah. right? So it's, it's all kind of in the kernel, so there's um, some lower overhead there. Sounds like it would be more generally useful, though. Or it, could um, be. it could be. There, there's maybe some thoughts that you know we might be able to use it. Uh, some folks for the Dbus guys, for example, have been talking about maybe enabling some kind of uh, kernel direct message paths, something that they call it KDbus or something like that. Right, right. Um, and so maybe it's one of those things where this is somewhere that there could be some shared implementation, or maybe they can make use of Binder, or Binder could you know be reworked slightly to be able to work uh, right. for their needs as well. Uh, but we'll just have to see. All that's kind of speculative. So. And the last piece there, Ashman, that we just about. So Ashman is actually really cool. Um, it has a couple of different functions for um, Android, and one of it's that they don't want to have tempfs mounted because people could just you know have applications that write to files to tempfs and then they die and nobody knows who to clean up after and that right. sort of thing. Um, that would just fill memory, so that's kind of a, a maintenance issue for the system. Right. Um, and so basically they don't want to have tempfs mounted, but they want to provide the same sort of shared file descriptors that can point to anonymous memory that uh, you can share between applications. Mm -hmm. And so Ashman basically just provides a kind of atomic way to create you know, an unlinked tempfs file, um, and so the file descriptor for that. And so when the application dies, it gets cleaned up behind it. And right. And you use it versus Binder in the sense that Binder, you use it for sending like a, a small message? So Binder's the way to communicate between the right. applications, but this is just shared memory that's well, structured. Shared memory is communicating as right. well, but I guess the thing but is that... You pass the you pass the file descriptor that right. you got from Ashman through Binder to the other process. So you so. do an allocation in Ashman, and then you get this file descriptor, and you, you send it through Binder to the application, they can access and then basically yeah, look at the same share. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so the... Uh, I guess the, the other cool thing that Ashman's in, uh, added is uh, this thing where you're able to basically unpin pages of memory. Mm. And this is neat because it basically allows the kernel to say, okay, if the kernel gets tight on memory, this chunk of, error, this chunk of memory can just be taken from you. Right. Um, and so if you're doing something like developing a cache or something, I think they use it for the browser, so sure. it renders a page. And basically when, um, you know, if under memory pressure, if this page is un unpinned, it's able to just take the kernel and just take that away from you. Right. So the application can say, "I have this memory here that I need to, to store something temporarily." Yeah, it would be. Used. And if it goes away, I can recreate it. It's not critical, but it's one of those things where you know, if you need the memory, this is what you should take. Right. And so it's a really neat kind of uh, more general feature. And so I'm trying to take that functionality and uh, push it upstream via basically an fadvise uh, flag. Right. Um, and that's going to be. It's, it, I think it's going to be interesting. There's been a lot of people who've kind of. Uh, me and said, oh, this would be really neat for various usage. Uh, we could see something maybe in virtualization that people would be able to use. It's kind of as a lot of parallels to the transcendent memory um, that the Oracle guys have been working on. Um, and then also, uh, I think, you know, just general applications, just being able to, you know. Yeah, like an application API that you could use that generates. Yeah. It's like actually this new uh, functionality that application that they learn that they can use that and yeah. if you make it available in the system it's actually really cool. And it, it's kind of interesting because it solves a lot of the same problems that um, some of the memory notifiers that people are kind of looking at yeah. uh, would be useful for. So the idea with memory notifiers is that you would get notified when the system is low on memory and as right. an application you can say okay well I'm going to let go of these resources that I maybe don't need. Um, that's, it's a different way of solving it. It's a that. different way of solving sort of the same problem yeah. and, and I think that both approaches are useful. It's, it's one of those things where the nice thing with Ashman is that the kernel doesn't have to ask the application to try to do something. Right. We can just take action immediately. Right. Um, whereas with memory notifiers, you know, it, it's in some cases you don't want to have to take the overhead of informing the kernel. You know, this can be released early or not. You want to wait till the moment where it's critical to be able to make your own decision. Yeah, it's nice when you offer functionality, which the application developer can already put it into the design of the program. Right. Yeah. He's thinking about it. Says actually, this piece of memory here, I can actually let go of this. It's not critical for yeah. me. And so it's just a different approach. But those those three are pretty. So with this, um, this, this change in, in the heart that people have had around the Android patches, and we've seen like um, stage and retake in a lot of the patches yeah. that are actually in the Android patch. How do you feel about this going forward? Like, what, what do you think um, the general open source 
um, feeling towards the Android patch that is, is going to be like? Um, so to some extent, people have been a little bit worn down. So the aspect is um, Android is kind of a major force, and people recognize that you know, right. it's out there. Um, I think people are very frustrated with um, having, in effect, a fork in the kernel community. It's not so much that it's a, a fork in the most negative sense, but yeah. just the aspect that you know, board vendors and that sort of things, they basically have two kernels that they have to do enablement for, yeah, or maybe they problem. just focus on one, and that means if they just focus on the Android uh, kernel, mm. um, their drivers might not make it upstream because they have Android dependencies. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I, I think people kind of generally recognize this as a negative. Um, I think ideally, you know, things like Linus kind of making somewhat of a decree at Kernel Summit um, kind of comes out of the fact that, kind of expected, I think, that people would solve this on their own in some time by now. And so the fact that it hasn't really gotten resolved and that, you know, it still continues to be contentious, I think that kind of what got him to the point of making a point like this really, we just have to do something here. Yeah. Um, and so to that, to a great extent, a lot of people were worn down from the debate. Um, you know, and so I think that there's a little less resistance. Um, a lot of the times, too, the difficulty was is some of the resistance was very theoretical. And so it's one of those things where the Android guys, you know, they have an existence proof of a working solution. Like, yeah. it, it, it's out there, it works, it's being shipped. Um, and so to kind of talk in hazy, sort of theoretical, well, it really should be done in this other abstract way, you know, it, it's, that, that, I guess, doesn't necessarily have as much concrete value. It's a tough um, argument, yeah. Um, and so, you know, if somebody were to, to step up and implemented alternatives and, you know, managed to demo that they got, you know, equivalent functionality out of it, yeah. um, it would have been, I think, maybe a more you know, constructive process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, it's one of those things where there's a lot of things where there's still issues in the code. We've got, you know, cases where now the, um, you know, even in the stuff that's gotten up into staging, just in the last little while, there's been tons of patches uh, Anton Vernesnev has been working on uh, the low memory killer. Yeah, yeah. And it got a whole bunch of criticism about, you know, it takes the task lock and it's just really not scalable for its usage. And um, so he's been able to go through and work with a lot of the, you know, high end kernel developers to be able to get this sort of solved and get it acted by a lot of the memory management folks. Um, and so that, that I think is, you know, really good as well. Um, but I mean, it's one of those things where there's, for a lot of these uh, patches that are you know, in the Android tree, that there is a lot of work still necessary to be done. It's just a matter of, Do I, think, I think the resistance on the more theoretical aspect, people are going to stop, you know, nitpicking maybe the design and say, okay, given this design, what is the best approach to doing it? Um, right. And so, yeah. Well, all right. Well, thanks a lot for the time, and I appreciate <laughs> it. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>